Welcome to another episode of the Rust Belt Apartment Podcast presented by the Cooper Multifamily Team, where we discuss all things apartments with a keen eye on the Midwest's Rust Belt region. I'm your moderator, Peter Grayless. As always, I'm joined by my teammate and co-host, Gary Cooper. We're pleased to welcome today's guests, Brian McCann and Willis Croker. Brian and Willis recently joined the Collier's Pittsburgh office, and we're happy to have them. Brian received his undergrad from Duquesne University in 2003, earned a law degree in 2006 from Duquesne as well, ultimately earned an MBA in cybersecurity and finance in 2011, no, 2015, I apologize, from the George Washington University. Prior to joining Collier's, Brian worked for the FBI for 11 years. In 2017, Brian returned to Pittsburgh to begin his career in commercial real estate. Since then, Brian has led the capital market teams and concentrated his practice on multifamily transactions. Willis received his undergrad degree from the University of Dayton, go Flyers, in <laughs> economics and marketing. He started his career in commercial real estate in 2019. Since then, Willis and Brian have worked together to advise private capital and institutional clients on all matters related to capital markets transactions. He joins Colliers as Vice President of Capital Markets, Multifamily. Gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having us. It's, our, it's our absolute pleasure. You know, Gary had mentioned that he had uh, taken some time to have dinner with you guys probably about a month ago now. And shortly after the dinner, uh, he popped over to my desk and said, hey, I've got a great next set of guests for the podcast. Um, so we certainly thought it'd be fun and, and informative to have a group that uh, operates in a very similar space that we do uh, in a city that's got a lot of similarities that, that Cleveland has as well. So it's kind of our, our Cleveland Pittsburgh show. Um, Willis showed up with his Steelers gear. We'll look past <laughs> that. Um, but again, guys, thanks for joining us. We're looking forward to having kind of a fun conversation here today. And I did set it up. It was like Pittsburgh v. Cleveland. So, uh, so you know, Willis, Willis came to play, which, uh, unlike <laughs> Either of our respective football teams, uh, that <laughs> that that might not be uh, properly said. True. But we're, we're super excited to have you guys not only on the podcast but part of the Collier's team. Uh, I think as we're growing our platform and and uh, making an impact here in the Midwest, it's great to have a uh, a very competent uh, Rust Belt co counterpart in Pittsburgh. I don't know if Pittsburgh qualifies as the Midwest, does it, or is it considered East? So it's kind of like, it, it's really the gateway. We've kind of always said that we kind of hold the hands between the Midwest and the Mid-Atlantic. So depending on who you talk to, like right? I mean, we're only 12 miles from the Ohio border, um, which a lot of people don't realize. If you kind of head to Cranberry and head directly west, you're, you're pretty much in Ohio. Um, you know, and our market's only being really an hour and 45 minutes away from each other. Um, they're pretty close. But yeah, depending on who you talk to, they'll say, hey, you're part of the Mid-Atlantic or the East or you're part of the Southeast or you're part of the Northeast or you're part of the Midwest. So kind of which I, I think is kind of actually emblematic of why both of our cities are, are kind of so special is, you know, we, we talk about this a lot. Our cities are kind of geographically located in, in some very key parts of the country that can't be replicated. No um, doubt. So when you look at a one day's drive from either of our markets, right, 500 miles, you have almost half of the North American population, which a lot of people don't realize, you know, you can get to uh, basically any major city and, you know, a two hour flight, you're pretty much at any major city other than what's on the West Coast. Um, from the, So strategically, you know, I think that's, you know, we'll, I'm sure we'll get into this kind of why Cleveland and Pittsburgh have really started emerging on the multifamily stage. And I think we'll continue to do so for, for the next few years to come. Yeah, well I, 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 yeah, and I agree completely with that. Um, so obviously, I was joking whether you guys are part of the Midwest or not, but you're, Pittsburgh is certainly part of the Rust Belt. Uh, <laughs> and that's what this podcast is. So who cares about the Midwest or East or Mid Atlantic? You know, what matters to us is the Rust Belt, where returns and all things are possible still in multifamily. Um, and as Peter sort of set that up, and I think before we start talking about the real estate stuff, I mean, FBI agent, 11 years. Tell us more <laughs> about that, where where you were located, and there's got to be some really good stories there. 
Yeah. So, I mean, interesting story. It's kind of like, you know, like every 18 year old, I knew exactly what I was going to do with my life and had my life planned out. And mm-hmm. uh, as I like to say, you know, best made plans don't survive first contact. Um, you know, I think I quoted that. I think, so, you know, I think you can. <laughs> 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 um, but no, I, I, uh, I wanted, I was uh, undergrad computer science and I wanted to get into cyber patent law. And um, when I got into it in law school, my second year, I started taking patent law courses. I kind of realized this probably wasn't the path that I really wanted to do. And I was sitting there scratching my head and um, I was a volunteer firefighter actually during law school um, in, um, in McCandless, which is a suburb just north of Pittsburgh. And a few of us would get together on Saturdays for breakfast. And, um, you know, I was kind of, you know, sitting there uh, lamenting that, uh, you know, my best, my, my career ambitions pretty much went out the window, actually, I, when I realized what it meant. Mm. And uh, one of the um, other volunteer firefighters was actually an FBI agent and kind of kind of grabbed me in a headlock and said, hey, I got, got an idea. Um, you know, I kind of know your personality. I kind of, you know, see what, you know, you're interested in and you seem to have, you know, an educational background that would be suited because at the time, and they still are, the Bureau was recruiting attorneys and computer scientists pretty heavily. Um, sure. So that was my second year of law school. Um, it's a long process to apply. So I applied uh, toward the end of my second year and luckily timing worked out and I graduated my uh, on June 5th uh, in 2006. And I got a call a week later that said, pack up your stuff and we got a class date for you at Quantico. So uh, that was the start of uh, kind of the career there, worked counterterrorism, counterintelligence, um, but always had an, kind of an interest in real estate and finance, um, you know, my entire time there. So uh, in 2017, uh, you know, um, we decided to make the move back to Pittsburgh. Um, my wife, who I had met in New York City at the time, because my first office was Cincinnati. Uh, then I was in Philadelphia. Then I went down and worked at the Hoover Building, uh, the lovely, beautiful building in Washington, D.C. And uh, then I was up in New York um, as well, too. Uh, working. So I, during my career, I worked counterterrorism, counterintelligence, and advised a number of senior FBI officials. Um, but then uh, in New York, I met my wife and uh, we moved back to Pittsburgh. She had never been there before. So she got the oh. full Rust Belt experience. <laughs> she an East Coaster, Brian? She, yeah, she was uh, from New Jersey area originally, um, but uh, she went to Dickinson undergrad. And then afterwards, uh, she did her graduate studies um, at St. John's and was in New New York City for, for 10 years. So she was pretty much almost native uh, to New York City at the time. So she had been there long enough, um, which I said, she's she's a much better person than me. She's director of child psychology at Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh. Oh, which, very uh, cool. You know, really interesting. So yeah, but she, I think she had a little bit, you know, coming back to the Midwest, it's, uh, it's a little bit different pace. So, but now we've settled <laughs> in and uh, we had our first uh, one month ago. So, uh, Congrats. you know, we're excited. So. Congrats. So 11 years at the Bureau, was it just time for a change? So I always, as, as I, you move up, right, I was, I was started off as a field agent, you know, do, do, Cincinnati being my first office. Um, as you move up, you kind of get a, into management, you get a little bit more into the bureaucracy and a little bit more, uh, you know, away from the stuff that you probably joined to do. Mm. Um, so as I, I, I went up and kind of moved up, um, you know, I was looking to kind of go into the private sector. Um, I had a couple different offers, um, doing some different things in the cybersecurity field. Um, but I always had a passion for real estate. I actually, um, during my time in the Bureau, I went on to iTunes University and took almost every real estate finance course that I could <laughs> find. They had a bunch out of Columbia. So I got into that, started buying small stuff myself, um, and just absolutely love, you know, six units, 12 units where we could find it, some in South Carolina, some in Pittsburgh, um, and absolutely loved uh, the, the, the entire multifamily process um, and kind of moved back and said, hey, this is something that I really want to do and kind of make a career out of. Um, since it was kind of like I was in it for 11 years and it was that time where if you stay much longer, you're probably going to stay till retirement or mm-hmm. if you're going to make a move, it's probably time to make the move at that, that kind of mark. So. Okay. Okay. Very interesting. Mm-hmm. Willis, uh, I know it's kind of, kind of a tough, a tough story to follow. <laughs> Tell us about uh, getting drunk at the ghetto at University of Dayton. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure I, I have kid. a lot of great memories there. Just d- don't remember a lot of it, but I'm pretty sure I had a good time. <laughs> <laughs> How about Willis, quick, quickly, your, your background. So um, from yeah. Pennsylvania, I went to school at UD. Yep. So I uh, grew up in the Ligonier, uh, Pennsylvania, which is a very small town, about 3,000 people. Uh, people might be familiar. This small town about 10 minutes down the road called Latrobe, Pennsylvania, the home of Fred Rogers and Arnold Palmer. 
Um, if you look at my resume, you will see a bullet point there that says I have had an Arnold Palmer made by Arnold Palmer. Very proud of wow. that. Oh, <laughs> that's pretty Just cool. Just for all the listeners out there, it's if you want to go by the master, it's uh, iced tea first and then lemonade. <laughs> Good to know. Good to yeah, know. So then um, I think we touched on earlier is Pittsburgh a uh, Midwestern town or a uh, Mid-Eastern, I definitely say Midwestern in my time in Dayton, Ohio, I definitely would say there's a very similar vibe around the people. Back, you, you talk to your neighbors, you know the neighbors. I frankly don't think I've ever lived anywhere where I frankly locked my front door. Um, <laughs> trust the neighbors and safe neighborhoods. I've really enjoyed it. And then, to be honest, never really had a, my plan in college was never to go into real estate. I uh, had a job lined up in D.C. at a place where I'd interned. And about two weeks prior to graduating, I got a call that said I was a budget cut before I got there. Wow. So luckily, I hadn't signed a lease or anything yet. But um, at the time, I had a cousin working in SVN who shared an office with Brian. And I get a call from him and says, hey, there's a person in my office that he's looking to hire someone. Would you be interested in an interview? Well, I said, absolutely. Like two weeks prior to college, I, I don't want to move back home with my parents. So I said, sure. absolutely. Give me the interview, please. He said, OK, well, it's in 15 minutes. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, and so I, I came into the industry very green as far as knowing the real estate industry and everything, but I did my best to sell Brian on my ability to learn and the fact that I'm coachable and past four years of Brian kind of been thrown into the fire and it's been a fantastic learning experience. I've grown to love the industry and the opportunities it's provided me. Hey, Willis, could you share too uh, the one time what happened when you golfed with Arnold Palmer? Oh, come on now. <laughs> oh, yes, please. So, I was, uh, so we, we were down golfing in Bay Hill in Florida and uh, me and my buddy were playing and I, f- I think it was hole six or seven. All of a sudden this golf cart comes behind us. And what do you know? It's, it's Arnold Palmer right behind us. And just for a little context, I, I went to grade school with his granddaughter. So I, I had known him and met him a few times and he comes up behind us and he's like, yeah, do you mind, mind if I watch for a hole or two? And I was like, I'm 16 years old at the time, but I, I know I was speaking to my grandfather, my father. I, I know how big of a figure Arnold Palmer is. So I go to tee off, and by no means have I ever been a good golfer. So I'm expecting a slice, a hook, who knows, but my hands are shaking. I go take a big swing, hoping to hit the perfect drive in front of him, and I miss the ball. <laughs> <laughs> I turn around about as embarrassed as can be, and Arnold Palmer just cool and collected looks at me and goes, it happens all the time. <laughs> so eventually, I think I ended up uh, smacked a couple balls into the, the woods, uh, one into the water in front of him, but got the opportunity to play a whole golf with Arnold Palmer. So it's pretty fun. Good man. story, man. Real good story. Now, in, uh, in your, uh, you know, you're, you're uh, both of you originally from Pittsburgh, and I think your families have been Pittsburgh for a while as well. Yeah, mine's from about, I was originally about an hour away, but Wheeling, West Virginia. Um, but I kind of considered Pittsburgh home after undergrad and law school. When I'd come back and visit, I kind of stayed in Pittsburgh and would make the quick drive down to, to Wheeling to visit family and friends and then back in. But um, and in a lot of my um, immediate family is still in, in Wheeling. Gotcha. Gotcha. And I only said that because I was with you gentlemen and uh, we were at the Duquesne Club in Pittsburgh, which obviously is a, a very famous place. But uh, I think, Willis, uh, your grandmother was the first woman member at the Duquesne Club. It was. And um, so my, my family, my mom's side of the family is from the area. Uh, actually grew up around the Seven Springs area. My, my great grandfather was actually the one who founded Seven Springs. And uh, so that was a family run business until it was sold to uh, Bob Nutting in 2006. So I, as soon as I could walk, I got a pair of, sti- a pair of skis put on my feet. Jeez, sure. Um, and then uh, my dad was from uh, the Baltimore area who moved to uh, Pittsburgh around 1970. So we got a lot of roots here in Pittsburgh, a lot of family in the area, love the area. Fantastic. Well, one of the things I wanted to bring up is, is we talk about the similarities in, in Cleveland and Pittsburgh, and obviously a lot of folks go to obviously the uh, short two-hour drive uh, on the turnpike between, between the cities. A lot of people will talk about obviously some of the sports teams, although you know certainly uh, uh, the Penguins and Pirates don't necessarily compete against the Guardians and Cavaliers, uh, but we do have our, our football <laughs> teams that have never seemed to be both good at the same time. Um, but if, if you look at it, so the population of Cleveland 
uh, the Cleveland MSA right now is 1,761,000 people. The MSA population of Pittsburgh is 1,699,000 people. So again, only a little over 60,000 people separate Cleveland and Pittsburgh in terms of the MSA. Uh, in both cities, their peak population was 1970, literally the year 1970 for, for both of them. And uh, Pittsburgh's apartment market's 146,000 uh, market rate apartments. And Cleveland is 169,000 uh, market rate apartments. So again, a lot of um, similarities in terms of the size, the population, I think the background in, in economic factors. Um, tell us more, uh, especially because uh, a lot of our folks are not folks that, uh, you know, have seen the Pittsburgh market because velocity has never been huge, huge in Pittsburgh. Uh, but talk a little bit about the, the apartment market there, what you're seeing and where the opportunity you think lies. I think it's interesting. So we talk about this a lot and we'll do a presentation a lot for new institutional investors into Pittsburgh. And if you really look at Pittsburgh, and I think Cleveland's probably very similar in the way, we were obviously more of the industrial town when you talk about the early 1900s and through the mid 19, you know, 2000 or the 20th century. And then we kind of went through a change. And I think when Pittsburgh, you hit it on, on the nail on the head is, is a lot of what we had was old historical buildings and old historical ownership that didn't have a lot of institutional appetite. And there was a concern for a long time that if they, if an institutional player came into the market and made a purchase, were they going to be able to exit? Was there going to be enough of a market when they went to exit? So even though the returns looked great, was there going to be a liquidity trap? So we saw a couple of things, and we point this out a lot, is you know when you look at 2007 um, on the national stage, it's kind of when people started scratching their heads and saying, hey, this MSA Pittsburgh, it didn't drop. Most of the MSAs had this huge drop. And it's because we just used to chug along at two, 3% growth year over year. We never saw a huge spike. We never saw a huge decline. So everybody was like, that's kind of interesting, right? This is a market that seems to not, you know, um, be able to be hit in an economic downturn as much. And then if you look, I think what really happened is in 2013, 2014, Uber announced that they would put their advanced technology division in Pittsburgh, which is their self-driving cars. And it's really for one reason. It was they were looking for the talent that was coming out of Carnegie Mellon. And if you look at Carnegie Mellon, it's been the top in artificial intelligence and robotics for years. I mean, this isn't, this isn't something new in the last decade. This is really, you know, stemming back to when I was in college. Um, the thing is, is not that many people cared at the time about artificial intelligence and robotics. And now it is really being at the forefront and the cutting edge of technology. So you saw this stark shift um, where Pittsburgh went from this industrial town, uh, old sleepy town on the rivers with a bunch of steel mills to really being an area that had some budding technology come out of it. Now, when you shift that to the apartment market, what does that mean? And I think what's really interesting is we did not build a lot and we did not build high quality, what we would call class A product much in the 90s and the early 2000s. So we basically had this huge void of newer built product um, that needs to be filled. And I think now it's starting to be filled. And we see, if you talk to someone who's from Pittsburgh and you see the pipeline and everyone's like, are we overbuilding? And the answer is really, we're not even caught up to where we should be. Um, we actually have this huge demand for product that continues to, to come down. And now we see the kind of the acceleration of that technology boom um, that's happening in Pittsburgh. And you see, you know, you have Uber, Argo AI, uh, you know, Aurora, those groups that kind of came to Pittsburgh in the downstream industries. And then, you know, recently uh, Duolingo, uh, you know, they went public. So you kind of have a unicorn coming out of Pittsburgh. So now you're starting to attract more and more attention from the West Coast technology firms and the VC firms that are coming into the city. And now we're seeing a number of institutional trades. So we don't have that concern for the liquidity trap anymore. So Pittsburgh is now on the radar because returns are still there and there's an exit. And most players are kind of, um, you know, looking at that as well, too. And, you know, Gary, I'd be 
I'll kick that to you because you're the expert on Cleveland. I don't want to, you know, pretend to know, you know, as much as you in the market. So I, I'd be interested to see how you would say that would compare and contrast to what has happened in Cleveland as well. Yeah. And that's the one place where we truly haven't turned the corner yet. Um, you know, so there's two things. There's the liquidity trap that you talk about is what does that exit look like, right? And then this, I think the second part of that goes sort of hand in hand is, you know, hey, what's the sales velocity? You know, if I come into Pittsburgh, buy this 220 unit, 230 unit deal, you know, can I get another two, three, four buildings there. So I have a 1500 unit portfolio and can take advantage of some management efficiencies, get a regional there, not be you know, worried about you know, who, how in the world I'm going to manage this and so forth. And so that's certainly something that, that, that Cleveland shares with, uh, with Pittsburgh in the, in the sense that that velocity number, you, know, you have a lot of folks coming into the market especially on the institutional side, it's like, hey, I can't get the scale necessary to continue. Um, I think uh, the, the part of yours that was sort of answered is, hey, can can there be decent exits? Is there an exit strategy? And I think it's back to what you said. There's, there's always been institutional interest in Pittsburgh, um, maybe even more so than Cleveland. And some of it has to do with the, the politics, the business. I think the way the community of Pittsburgh has come together to sort of uh, turn, you know, we obviously uh, affectionately uh, call this the Rust Belt podcast, but, you know, Pittsburgh turned that corner well before Cleveland mm -hmm. sort of embraced technology, embraced business, uh, you know, sort of uh, the social and cultural institutions and the political folks getting along. We haven't quite figured that out in Cleveland yet, which again, I think held us back a little bit more. But, you know, we're hopeful that there was some institutional stuff that's on the market and, and we're hoping uh, our trajectory starts to look a, a lot like Pittsburgh, because, again, as you said, it really gives you an opportunity once you can confirm, hey, there is an exit strategy. And the uh, biggest thing is in Pittsburgh is, again, you guys went from being a very sleepy low velocity city to, you know, you've had some decent sales. And I know you've been a big part of some of the some of the major sales that have in the last couple of years, but, you know, you've seen a big run up in Pittsburgh sales, right. In 19, 20, 21, you know, through COVID and, and through today. No, I definitely agree. And it, it's interesting that you brought it up too, because the, the political environment, I think, you know, I, I know Pennsylvania is shifting and I think Ohio is too, but, you, you know, please tell me is like, I think they're, they're looking to enact some more and more policies. I know uh, Pennsylvania is on path to start cutting their corporate income tax um, to bring it down to kind of do for, further attraction uh, policies. And I know Ohio has been kind of uh, looking at different things that they can do, which I think puts, there's so much synergy, I think, between our markets. I mean, you know, Gary, we've been lucky enough where you've come out to Pittsburgh and I've been out there and our, you know, our respective clients are, you know, they're making that drive back and forth pretty frequently now. Um, so I think hopefully those policies um, that they kind of put in place will continue to kind of spur business growth for both of our cities, because I think, you know, I think we can, we can benefit from each other. If both cities are rising, you know, being less than two hours apart, there, there can be its own ecosystem. Um, you know, obviously top-notch universities uh, in Cleveland and top-notch universities in Pittsburgh too. Uh, so you have that whole tech eds and meds. Uh, you really have, if, um, you know, some rounded out synergy between the two cities. Does Pittsburgh have the, the healthcare presence that, that Cleveland has? Massive. Um, okay. UPMC, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, um, is, is really, really a powerhouse um, when it comes, uh, and they, they're marching mostly east. Um, mm -hmm. So they're kind of expanding eastward, uh, you know, all the way out through the state. Um, we have over 700,000 uh, square foot currently in development of wet lab space. So when you talk about biotech, biotech is now becoming a huge aspect. Um, there's an area, Oakland is where uh, University of Pitt and UPMC. So if you hear, hear me refer to Oakland, um, and Carnegie Mellon, those universities are all there. There's an area in South Oakland, uh, which is a new kind of park is where they're building a ton of uh, wet lab space right now to kind of take advantage of some of the biotech research that's coming out of those universities and those healthcare systems, uh, um, which is truly massive. And then you also have Allegheny Health Network. Um, so we actually have two massive healthcare systems um, that are both in the city. Are you seeing development follow those systems into communities like Oakland? 
Yeah, the the problem is is there's no land available. Um, <laughs> so uh, you know, one of the things that's you know about Pittsburgh is we have a lot of hills, we have a lot of rivers. Um, so you really can't go too far without going over a bridge or going through a tunnel. Um, you know, which it makes the area really interesting um, in a good way. Uh, like you know. The, the, the geography is just beautiful, especially this time of year in the fall, because you can usually look at the hills and the trees, um, but it makes public transportation and it makes development challenging uh, mm. because, you, you know, you have land constraints. And so Oakland is probably one of the hottest submarkets that in the strip district of Pittsburgh, um, where land is highly valuable uh, and there's not a lot to come by. So it, it, it's difficult. Um, I think we would see a lot more de- development if there was more land available, but um, you are constrained by that. When I was selling a property in, in Pittsburgh, uh, that goes back to two, early 2019, uh, it was out in Moon Township, so right by the airport, right? And so the, sh- the Shell Cracker Factory was just finishing up and st- start starting to get going. How has that all gone? Because that was, a, what, a three, four, five billion dollar investment by uh, Royal Dutch Shell. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's online and running, and I think it's doing well out there. And obviously, you see the, um, you know, we're, I think we're doing, it keeps going up. I think we're at $1.2 billion in an airport renovation project. It might even be slightly higher now. Um, so that's actually really interesting in kind of modernizing the Pittsburgh airport. I think with Shell Cracker, the interesting part was is they're wondering if there's going to be more of those built along the river, um, which would kind of have its own ecosystem as well. Yeah, um, we talk about tech eds and meds being kind of in the core of Pittsburgh, but I think you hit on the key point there, Gary. Is we have this kind of like I, I always call it the concentric circle um, around Pittsburgh of transportation and, and logistics, uh, and Shell Crackers are the prime example of that. Um, we have a number of major interstates, you know, coming through our area, and then obviously the three rivers that that, that come, you know, the Monongahela and the Allegheny forming the Ohio. So I think all of that gives us a really interesting uh, part for transportation and logistics. Um, you know, Shell Cracker is up and running. Um, th- you know, they've taken advantage of a lot of, uh, you know, advanced technology. So a lot of their systems are automated. So it's not this high job growth. Um, it is a job growth. But I think what would be interesting is if you see one or two more of those plants come online and then the downstream industries that would come to follow. I think that's where it could get very interesting. Yeah, and I, I think that's the big thing with with uh, the cracker plants, right? Is that you know I think they end up with, uh, and I'm not sure if it's for the plastics industry or there's something that basically they produce that's very difficult to transfer. So all of a sudden, you know, you're getting uh, a lot of sort of spinoffs and development that happen because you've got to be close to that plant, and it's sort of what's happening in the chip factories. Uh, so if you go, you know, out in Phoenix, for example, the, you know, I mean, there's probably $100 billion with the chip factories being built, um, which yeah, it always amazes me because water is one of the biggest natural resources you need. And Phoenix is not where you think <laughs> of for, uh, for, for water resources. But, you know, what's really spinning off from them is the amount of, I mean, you start thinking just the acetone, the etching, the stuff that they do, all these chemical companies and stuff have exploded in and around these you know, developing and, you know, not spending quite the B mark, but, you know, they're building two, three, four hundred million dollar, you know, facilities in and around these that do employ, you know, much more than maybe the actual chip manufacturing does. So. No, I've, absolutely. And I think that's what I, I think that's the interesting part on, on crack the cracker plant specifically is what would be the downstream industries and, and the, the support industries that come around it. Um, and, and I think that's that could be a good opportunity for growth, depending on where where we go with that in the future. Yeah. Well, uh, one of the uh, most exciting projects that's being built right now in downtown Cleveland, and we've had, you know, much like you for 40 years, we didn't have much construction. And then if you look at the last five years, there's been a number of ground up, you know, construction deals that have been built. Uh, but, the you know, and and they've got, obviously have, have really had really good success uh, I think the occupancy numbers, I think the rent numbers have blown people away on what has been accomplished. Very, you know, even during COVID, uh, you had very little bit of, you had a little bit of a lull or maybe a speed bump, but it quickly came back. But one of the ones that I'm most excited about is a property called City Club, uh, City Club Apartments, which is next to the City Club in Cleveland, uh, the free speech um, uh 
organization. But, you know, Jonathan Holtzman, who is, you know, the the owner of the City Club brand and the developer, I think is one of the most fantastic uh, operators that really blends hospitality and multifamily extremely well. And I know, I think you sold one of his Pittsburgh properties for him and have worked with them. Can you tell us what we should be expecting from City Club here in Cleveland and and uh, what your perception is and maybe a little bit more about that deal because that was really a marquee deal. Yeah, it, it's interesting. So um, I, I actually met, uh, you know, Jonathan Holtzman actually when he was going through zoning of his new project in downtown Pittsburgh that is, um, I think, has not come out of the ground yet, um, but it's going to be at the old YMCA that was in downtown Pittsburgh. He's building um, uh, over 250 units, um, which would be kind of a high rise construction. Um, but I got to meet him. Uh, you know, we ended up working together on um, Southside City Club Apartments at the time, um, which was a, you know, a very interesting, it was in Southside Works, uh, which was a new development area. And uh, we sold that um, at last year. So uh, in January of last year, um, actually, I apologize. I'm losing track. It was January of this year. I'm losing track of my, day, my, my dates. It feels like the next year. Um, so we sold that in uh, to Brookfield, uh, which was an acquisition, which I think is a, kind of another emblematic of, uh, uh, you know, another big um, institutional, um, you know, multifamily owner that's coming in, coming into Pittsburgh and kind of making an establishment. Um, and I think one of the things that's very interesting, I've had the privilege now of touring several of uh, Jonathan Holtzman's products um, in Louisville and Cincinnati, um, and then obviously in Pittsburgh, as he's a real big believer on the blend of hospitality and, and apartments. And I think when you come to look at what are the renters demanding today, and it's a very highly amenitized product. And you know, we talk a lot about this in Pittsburgh. I think actually there was a the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. We actually had were interviewed last week, and they just ran an article on Sunday talking about some of the conversions in downtown. And one of the things that we talk about is square footage is becoming less and less important. So it's not how mm -hmm. big the unit is, but it's really what does the building have to offer? And I think back in the day, and I even think when I was running in DC and New York, you know, the amenities would always sell me on living there, but I never used them, right? I, I think I went into the club room like, you know, twice in the time that I lived in DC. And I think it's because they had a coffee machine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so a, little bit, a little bit of a caffeine junkie on, the, on our team. So, um, but, you know, I, I think that's changed a little bit and you're seeing um, in, in the different hybrid work from home uh, environment, um, you know, when you're going into the office less, you're seeing a couple things. One is you want more of a sense of community of where you live. So having those areas that you can socialize in, um, I think is important. And I think also having some space outside your apartment, especially if it's not that large, to do work or just to move and be in a different space, whether you're doing Zoom calls or podcasts or whatever the case may be, um, you see that. And I think that's one of the things where, um, you know, Jonathan Holtzman takes a lot of his inspiration from hotels um, and kind of looks at that. His decor is always top notch. Um, I could never put it together. I don't have the design eye, but if you tour his products, it's always very interesting. Um, and he does it very, very well um, and does it amenities. And I think the other thing too is uh, we're seeing, I think in our market, we're 65% of runners now have pets. Um, mm -hmm. Jonathan's is kind of a big on supporting um, pets as well too. I know he has a, kind of one of his projects is, is uh, he does a number of, um, I think he has a nonprofit dedicated to wildlife uh, so he does a number of things there. So I think it's exciting. It's exciting. And he's also big on going into the urban core. Um, and I think that's interesting for both of our markets as we're seeing more and more development in the urban core. So I'm sure it'll be a class A um, top notch product with high amenities for Cleveland, which is yeah, yeah. Well, the Cincinnati project they mentioned, I mean, that's one of my favorite properties. And it's amazing what you've done from the, the rooftop down to the bakery and coffee shop that are in there and you know, in took an old building and but yet the units themselves feel like you're in a very modern, um, modern space and laid out in a great way. But I, I think the, the key thing is that like yeah, we've been talking about for the last 10 years, there's been, you know, the amenities race in multifamily development in multifamily space. And I think the differentiator with Jonathan, it's not the amenities itself, right? I mean, everybody's got 
what a dog wash or a pool or the workout facility or the club space or whatever. It's really the experience, right? So it's all about the experience, not the amenity itself. Uh, because like you said, the amenity itself, you take it or leave it or whatever, and everybody sort of has it. You know, what differentiates the great operator now from the other folks? And it's the experience, how they can infuse life into whether it's a workout area, whether it's, you know, the restaurant or bakery or, you know, pet shop or whatever, you know, uh, that they do there. And I think Jonathan's just as good as anybody uh, at being able to do that. Yeah, I think, you know, it's, uh, you know, I think he'll, if you talk to him, he'll tell you, if you stay in a great hotel, right, if you stay in, you know, a, a high-end Marriott or Four Seasons, as you said, Gary, it's the experience, right? It's when you're walking through, I think I remember reading a Dale Carnegie book, and he was saying that he was staying in a Ritz, and he was walking through one time, he's given a presentation and he made the comment to somebody, he's like, oh, I don't think I have markers. And it happened to be a maintenance employee who basically stopped what he was doing and went out and found markers for, for them. And he found out later, like this wasn't his job, but it was the point of like, you know, when you take, when your employees are taking ownership of your guests or your, your renter's experience, um, I think that's a huge thing. And I think that's kind of what's something that, you know, he, he preaches a little bit. Um, because you, you, when you remember that, right, those are memorable moments Completely. where they kind of go above and beyond and you're, you're surrounded by great top notch amenities. But like you said, the, the experience of it is just amazing. And, and that's why I think the apartment business has such legs, you know, it's much more, you know, now we're, that we're doing it, you know, if you start, you know, and obviously home interest rates and some other things have gone in the wrong direction, uh, as far as seeing the expansion of that. But I think even if rates would have stayed the same, you know, because of how apartments are being built and how they're catering to people's, you know, lifestyle and experience, they're like a real option. You know, it's not like a full, you know, before it was, you know, render by necessity or like, oh, you know, I kept, couldn't find it. So I couldn't do this. And I think now it's all renter by choice, um, you know, and they're choosing with their pocketbook in terms of, you know, experience and lifestyle. And I think, the, you know, we've seen that. You know, folks that have like the workforce housing product that have been able to up their game a little bit and offer some things that the other typical workforce housing doesn't gives them a huge advantage. Uh, and it's more than just the tile backsplash or the new LBT flooring. Like you said, they're bringing the, some of the experiential kind of things into that and giving people choices. And when you give people choices, especially in the workforce housing product, you know, these folks don't get a lot of choices and they might not be, you know, renters by, you know, the renters by necessity rather than renters by choice. Um, and you start, you know, giving that experience or that lifestyle, you know, you've got them for a much longer time period and a much better quality tenant, I think, moving forward. I, I you know, you just, when you were saying that is we have a great operator that's come into Pittsburgh. Um, we've sold him a couple products, um, which is Post Road, and they're in that workforce housing space. And you know, they, they bought, uh, you know, basically almost a small community. Um, mm -hmm. guest on the podcast here there you go so, jonathan a, you listening a treat for guests uh, <laughs> and our listeners because um you know again i i just think he's a genius and and what he's doing uh right now and and for the market um pittsburgh obviously you know we're you know the capital markets are very disruptive exists. So it's interesting is the typical buyer now is 
The only category that we have not seen come into Pittsburgh yet, which we thought we were, and it has not, is really the um, the DSTs. Uh, so the okay. Delaware Statutory Trust, right? So we haven't seen, and we've talked to, to many of those, but you look at some of the, you know, the big DSTs like Inland, um, and, and then we haven't seen them make an entry into the market yet. Um, otherwise, pretty much we have seen institutional, we have seen uh, syndicates, we have seen the funds, we have seen a lot of private capital. Um, you know, it, private regional private capital is starting to scratch their head a little bit because the we are seeing, starting to see returns start to compress, um, you know, which the whole country saw to be, to be sure. fair. Um, but, you know, they were starting to compress and now they're having to start to compete with uh, institutional capital coming out of New York, Boston, or even the West Coast. Um, so I think we will continue to see that. Um, one of the interesting things I think for both of our markets is we, we, we're calling it the snapback a little bit. We're seeing capital that what kind of during COVID, you saw a lot of money flooded into the Sun Belt. Um, and obviously the returns were getting pretty tight down there. I think we were talking with a couple groups that, you know, um, somebody told me the other day they bought a 3.3 cap in, uh, in, in Florida. Someone else bought a 2.9 cap, um, you know, at the height of, uh, you know, kind of, you know, when the returns were really getting compressed. And then you see that kind of things are like, well, hey, wait a minute, I can still get a return in Pittsburgh or Cleveland, right? And we're starting to develop an institutional exit. Um, so I think that's where we're seeing more and more of these institutional groups that were kind of flooding down into the Southeast um, and, you know, kind of going in that area. We're actually seeing that capital work back up. And I think that's where, you know, we've been very successful. And I say we as the bigger platform here, including you, is, is, you know, Gary and stuff. Yeah. We're able to reach out as we don't take this myopic view that we know everyone. We utilize the resources that are kind of like behind us so that we can provide local market expertise, but pull capital in from areas where capital has not come before. And I think that's, the, um, you know, and for the listeners that don't know, Gary and I, you know, we're, we're, you know, our two teams are kind of working on some stuff together because we're seeing things kind of, you know, back and forth. And I think that's what's really, really exciting as, you know, we kind of look at that and we leverage that larger platform and those larger relationships um, you know, to kind of pull capital from different areas. But Pittsburgh's really, really open. I would like to see some of the DSTs come in. I think they would do well uh, for, their, for their investor base, but that's the only one that we really haven't seen come into the area quite yet. So. Yeah, and, and now you've sort of broken that institutional glass ceiling. I think, you know, you will see that because of their fiduciary duty and sort of, you know, their con very conservative nature because of, you know, again, just obviously the structure and the setup that uh, I think you're going to you're going to you'll see that a little bit before we see it in here in Cleveland. But again, I think we will follow along. Well, as we as we sort of <laughs> as we sort of wrap up here, um, you know, so any, any deals that you, you want to tell our listeners about that you guys have going on in Pittsburgh right now that uh, might be attractive to, you know, importing capital uh, up and down turn, the turnpike here? Well, I think right now, unfortunately, we've seen a lot of individuals take a pause um, kind of mm -hmm. until we, we come out until the next year. I think everybody's waiting to see. The, what the treasuries do. Um, so there's a number of things that we work on as a, the BOVs um, that are out. We have a number of Uh, 141 properties, 212 units. So again, it's the a very typical ownership story in Pittsburgh is this family started buying duplexes and triplexes 20, 30 years ago, and it went well for them. So it they bought the next stop. duplex and triplex, yeah. bought the next one. And then you look up, they come to us in 2020, it's like, oh, by the way, we're currently at 141 properties total with 212 units, where it's just, it's over time to keep building and building.
you know, been plugged in and, and you know, lucky enough to meet some uh, some really good people on the platform who've actually accelerated kind of getting us integrated, uh, yourselves included, uh, which has just been awesome. So. You know, Browns jerseys and Steelers jerseys <laughs> on each other. But I'm in <laughs> Cleveland. Every time I come there, um, you know, I, I think, you know, it's it just really, really interesting. I learned something new about the city. Uh, I have friends out there, obviously, as you know, as like, I always have to, I have to give a shout out to Joe's Deli out in Rocky River, which is one yes. of the places I visit. Uh, so, one of the best delis in the city. Yeah, my, the best, uh, the, the, the best corned beef that I can have. So I, it's kind of funny, very close friends. And Every time I come out, I get sent home with a couple pounds of corned beef. So I think I gain about three pounds every time <laughs> I uh, take the trip. But Gary, you've always that's the way to do it, man. <laughs> and I tell you, I mean, the downtown. I think you know, uh, you know, we last time we were out there, we stayed at the Marriott downtown. Okay. Uh, nine. In, um, the nine, yeah. And you kind of see, and it's kind of interesting as you start to see that hybrid of uh, condos and uh, you know hotels and hospitality. We talked about that with, you know, City Club. And now we're seeing kind of that first project being proposed in Pittsburgh as well, the golf tower, where they're looking at potentially doing a hotel and apartments uh, combined with it together. So I think that's something that is going to be interesting in both of our markets um, as we move forward to kind of see that if that trend is going to continue. So. Is that golf tower project a conversion? As an office, so we're converting a lot of our historical office space. Sure. Um, the article in the, the Pittsburgh uh, Post-Gazette actually on Sunday talked about, I think we're at, Willis, if you remember correctly, we're at 60 some percent office still downtown when you look by square footage and some yeah. individuals have a goal of getting to 50, 50 uh, apartments and office hmm. and of course CD, which is an interesting uh, metric that kind of comes out there. So. Yeah, then even with like still a lot of building going on downtown, I believe last time we looked at the pipeline, we're sitting right around 1100 units of proposed projects and everything that's coming. I actually, uh, was just doing, we were updating our rental cop numbers and just some inside baseball for anyone listening. I still believe the best way to get your rental numbers is call and pretend you need to move in. And so that, that was the beginning of my day. And I found multiple, I had four different properties. I, I usually give myself a two month leeway. Like, hey, I want to move in December. I had four different properties downtown tell me that their next availability is in January or February. So they came and do any more leases today. So it's definitely... Nice to hear and definitely like a on the ground sense that we do have the demand downtown for these apartments that are coming in the pipeline and people want to live here and are continuing to seek highly monetized product downtown. Fantastic. Well, Peter, you want to wrap us up? Yeah, guys. Um, Brian Willis, thanks for joining us. Really appreciate your time. Uh, Collier's Pittsburgh Capital Markets team. Where can folks find you? I know you guys are both active on LinkedIn. Uh, any specific uh, shout outs, uh, contact information you'd like to share with uh, our listeners? Yeah, I mean, uh, you can email either of us. Uh, I'll give you my email. It's uh, bryan.mccann at colliers.com. Um, you know, uh, we you know, LinkedIn, please, uh, you, know, re, you know, join or request us. And uh, the Colliers Pittsburgh website for myself. I'll kick it over to Willis and give you his. Same avenues for me. You can find me on LinkedIn or my email address is uh, willis.crokercolliers. That's W-I-L-L-I-S dot C-R-O-K-E-R at colliers.com. Fantastic. We'll be sure to include uh, your contact information as well in our social posts uh, when the pod uh, gets released. Gentlemen, thanks again. Really appreciate it. Uh, I thought there was going to be a little more fist fighting here between Cleveland and Pittsburgh, but we played nice. So thank you. <laughs> Wow. Maybe if you have us back, Peter, we'll, we'll go, we'll go for a round two. We'll, we'll take the gloves off a little we bit. We may need a round two here. We may need like a it. round two. Because <laughs> uh, we really haven't dove into the metrics, um, which I think is interesting for both of our markets, but maybe that'd be a good follow-up because, uh, you know, we can start talking about the metrics and things that we're seeing as well there. So. I love that idea. I love that idea. Maybe it's a year end Pittsburgh versus Cleveland metrics discussion. Truly. Hopefully our football team will even up the series. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it guys. Take care. Absolutely. Guys. Thanks it's a for pleasure. Bye-bye.